The idea that the spirit of a dead person could possess the body of a living person and replace that living person's personality and memories with the spirit's own personality and memories, well, that's quite alien to Western philosophy and assumptions. But it's not completely alien to Western experience, which is why this program begins in the town of Watsika, located in Iroquois County, Illinois. A mainly agricultural community with a population of around 5,500, it lies 90 miles south of the city of Chicago. Its name comes from the wife of Gurdon Hubbard, the town's founder who set up a trading post there in 1821 for the American Fur Company. Hubbard's wife, of Native American origin, had the name Wachiki, which translates into the modern name Watsika. The events we are focusing on occurred in Watsika in 1878, when the population was under 2,000, and it involved a teenage girl called Laurency Venom. It was not until she was 13 years old that she suffered six months of dramatic mental illness, which was followed by an apparent spirit possession. Her illness was characterised by cataleptic fits, inexplicable pains in the breast and the stomach, and catatonic trances. During these trances, she claimed to speak with angels and spirits, and because of the publicity that this received, she attracted curious folk from across Illinois wanting to know more. This is the only existing image I have seen of Laurency and in this picture she looks to be more than 13 years old. But despite the spiritual overtones of her illness, the Venom family were not spiritualists, they were Methodists, and all they wanted was for their girl to get well again. They did not want a medium in the family. But since the doctors could find nothing physically wrong with her, the verdict was that she should be sent to the state asylum for the insane and the family's Methodist minister agreed with this. The nearest asylum at the time would have been Dunning in Chicago, or possibly in Peoria. So sadly, in late 1877, the family began making arrangements for her to be committed. But before this happened, another Watsika resident turned up on the Venom's doorstep, begging them not to do it. If you think about it, an asylum in those days was more of a warehouse for the unwanted than a hospital hoping to cure the patient. The visitor's name was Mr. Aza B. Roth, a respected member of the community, although the Venoms, apart from recognising him, did not know him personally. With guilt and anguish, Mr. Roth told Mr. and Mrs. Venom about the similar trouble he had had with his own daughter, Mary. She had suffered symptoms similar to Lawrence's, although possibly in a more extreme form, since they began when Mary was just six months old. Like Lawrence, as she grew up, she suffered fits, and she developed clairvoyant abilities that gained widespread attention. For example, even when blindfolded, Mary could read books and do everything as though she could still see normally. Attempts to cure her included bloodletting using leeches, after which she fell into harming herself with a knife. She needed to rid her body of blood, she told her father, before she then passed out. Her doctors prescribed a water cure in Peoria, but after 18 months of this treatment, Mary had not improved. When she became persistently violent, the Roth family finally agreed that the only remaining option was for her to enter an asylum for the insane. Not long afterwards, she died in July 1865 at the age of only 18. In his remorse over his daughter's death, Mr. Roth wanted no stone unturned to save this other young girl, Laurency and he recommended the services of a Dr. Winchester Stevens, like himself a spiritualist. He might be able to help, argued Mr. Roth. Better to try this than send Laurency directly to the asylum. And the Venoms agreed. When the possession of Laurency began, at first two other spirits appeared through her. One was Katrina Hogan, aged 63, who said that she'd flown in the sky to Watsika from Germany. 
and the other was Willie Canning, a spirit of a 20-year-old young man. Laurency said both of these were evil and forced her to say horrible things, and she was afraid of them. At this point, Dr. Stevens, a major participant in this unfolding drama, hypnotised Laurency to put her into a calmer state and suggested that if she were to be controlled by spirits, maybe she could find a happier, more intelligent one than either of these two. Laurency seemed to look around the room at other spirits. She mentioned the names of several deceased persons, adding that one who wanted to come was named Mary Roth. Mr. Roth, being present in the room at the time, declared, Mary Roth is my girl. She has been in heaven 12 years. And thus the door was opened for Mr. Roth's own dead daughter to possess the body of Laurency Venom. These events featured in a movie called Children of the Grave 2, The Possessed, produced for a channel called Spooked TV. From the title alone, with its creepy overtones, you can almost hear the dramatic music the fiendish and blood-curdling sounds associated with it. Here was a production intended to shock, like a typical Hollywood horror film. Here's one of several trailers for it that you can now freely view on YouTube. In my rather straight-laced view, garnishing this story with horror overtones does a disservice to the issue of spirit possession, even though making such films may be commercially attractive. If possession is real, its implications regarding the survival of the spirit after death deserves to be considered rationally rather than being exploited for cheap thrills. What we have here is a serious challenge to our understanding of the nature of reality. But back to the story. As soon as Lawrence's body was possessed by Mary, she failed to recognise her own family. In contrast, she not only recognised Mr and Mrs Roth, but called them Ma and Pa. This must have been upsetting for the Venoms. But they nevertheless agreed, after a week or so, for their daughter to move out of their own home, pictured here, and move in with the Roths at their home if this would help Laurency to get well. One important development was that the now re-embodied spirit of Mary announced she would be occupying Laurency's body for only about 14 weeks while Laurency herself retired to the spirit world to get better, leaving Mary to help cure her sick body. Remarkably, this new Mary, as we might now call Laurency, was familiar with the details of Mary Roth's life and family when she was alive 12 years previously. These were details that Laurency, as a teenager could not possibly have discovered for herself, since Mary had died aged 18 in an asylum when Laurency was still a one-year-old toddler. Normal research methods would not have sufficed, so it was unlikely that Laurency was simply inventing a possession in order to cheat. Until the possession occurred, Laurency never knew the Roth family. Once Mrs Roth heard that she was possessed by her own daughter, Mrs Roth and her other daughter Minerva came to visit the Venoms. When this new Mary saw them arriving at the house, she cried out, Here come Ma and Nervy! Nobody had called Minerva by the nickname Nervy in the 13 years since Mary had died, but this re-embodied Mary used it just as usual. As Mr. Azaroff put it, truly our daughter who was dead has been restored to us. The Mary who possessed Lawrence's body was happy, industrious, helpful and loving, and knew everything about the Ruff family. With Lawrence's family, on the other hand, she was courteous but distant, and dealt with them as strangers. Many of the incidents that this new Mary recalled had actually happened before Laurency was born.
For example, she met a rough family friend who had been widowed and then remarried after Mary's death. But this re-embodied Mary, not knowing of the marriage, called her by the previous married surname. She said, O oh Mary Lord, you look so very natural and have changed the least of anyone I've seen since I came back. But her surname was no longer Lord. The year following Mary Roth's death in 1865, she had remarried and become Mrs Wagoner. Again, two former neighbours to Mary before she died called on the Roths and the possessing Mary instantly recognised them as Auntie Parker and Nellie. And she asked, do you remember how Nervy and I used to come to your house and sing? On another occasion, with the intention of testing her memory, the Roths placed a velvet headdress belonging to their deceased daughter on a hat stand to see what would happen. When the new Mary came into the room, she recognised it immediately. She said, oh, there is my headdress I wore when my hair was short. But more was to follow. She asked for her box of letters from her former existence, and since Mrs. Roth had kept this in remembrance of her daughter, she found the box. In it were some mementos, and the re-embodied Mary exclaimed, Oh, Ma, here is the collar I tattered. Why did you not show me my letters and things before? In a letter to Dr. Stevens, Asa Roth expressed mixed feelings about the reception his family was getting for taking into their home a person other people knew as Laurency Venom. In a small place like Watsika, there were few secrets. Some appreciate our motives, Roth declared, but many, without investigation or knowledge of the facts, cry out against us and against that angel girl. Some say she pretends others that she is crazy, and we hear some say it is the devil. Having been forewarned at the beginning of the possession that Mary would stay in Lawrence's body only until May 1878, there was bound to be sorrow for the Roth family when it was time for Mary to leave. However, she had promised to release Lawrence's body, and she did so as predicted on the 21st of May. But not before emotional goodbyes were exchanged, and Mary gave assurances that she would still be close to them on the other side. In fact, there was an alternating of personalities for a short time, as though a struggle was taking place for control of the body. When Laurency finally reappeared for good, she told Mr. Roth and Minerva that it was as though she'd been asleep for a very long time. She now referred to Mr. Roth as Mr. Roth and not as Pa, and Laurency asked to go home to the Venom household across town. When she arrived there, she hugged and kissed her family, and her cure was complete, and her mental illness did not return. She had little knowledge of the possession during a lapse of three and a half months, however, she remained close to the Roths. Later in life, she married locally and gave her husband 11 children. This picture is of Laurency with her first-born baby. In 1879, Dr. Stevens published the story of Laurency Venom and Mary Roth in the Religio-Philosophical Journal. Subsequently, he wrote a book of about 50 pages entitled The Watsika Wonder, and he toured the United States for several years giving lectures about it until his death in 1885, at the age of 63. In 1890, the facts of this case were reviewed on behalf of the American Society for Psychical Research by the renowned sceptical researcher Dr Richard Hodgson, and he gave it qualified credence. In his book, The Principles of Psychology, also published in 1890, the renowned Harvard professor, William James, commented on the Watsika narrative as, and I quote, perhaps as extreme a case of possession of the modern sort as one can find. Nowadays, there's every possibility that psychiatrists would see it as a classic example of multiple personality, Indeed, in his 1901 book, Personality and its Survival of Bodily Death, 
Frederick Myers, the author and the founder of the British Society for Psychical Research, asserted that the Watsika Wonder case must be plainly presented, and I quote, as a pseudo-possession, if you will, determined in an hysterical child by the suggestion of friends. But I think there's a problem with this interpretation. If this was not a case of full possession by one spirit of another's body, then how did Laurency e. Venom have access to so many little details of the Roth's family domestic circumstances that took place before she was even born? In my view, this makes the story authentic, unless every single participant in it was a deliberate liar. If you want to judge the Watsika Wonder case for yourself, Amazon sells numerous editions, as you'll see if you watch the credits coming up. You can find it as a free PDF too, on the internet. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.